situations large number of people could join us in this uh, webinar i'll be presenting and discussing about certain aspects of uh, super capacitors which are emerging and which have emerged as uh, new age energy storage devices i'll be talking more about them as an introduction and also some of the work that we have carried out in at gandhi gram the lecture plan is as is usual an introduction to energy storage devices super capacitors their preparation and characterization so the question we ask is avoiding new super capacitors there is a clear cut idea that the fossil fuels and other fuels are expected to last only another couple of decades that means we need to go for our uh, new energy devices mainly people concentrate on photovoltaic devices and wind energy the problem is available electric power from these two things vary on the nature If it is overcast, suddenly the power fails, and wind can be generated any time. But with the wind fluctuating, the wind generated keeps changing. The other aspect is with the PV panels and all that. In the right, you don't generate power, so there is a need to store this energy. The other aspect is with this energy conversion and storage. We normally think of energy storage using batteries. The biggest problem with batteries is that they cannot supply large amount of power in a short duration. We normally say that uh, if you want to avoid the energy crisis, reduce the required energy and find new avenues. And uh, one of the efficient ways is to use CFL. This is a old slide. So most of the people have gone in for LED lighting. Heaters have to be insulated. Of course, it's a wrong idea here because uh, this season we need only air conditioners and all that. We need to have air conditioners with high efficiency. Better than that, I think we need to use electrochromic devices. We change color on the application of electric field so that. the climate inside a room can be made comfortable other things that people go for is to use false roofing and placing empty parts on the roof which reduces the radiation that gets into the room and the reason why i have small request please all the participants please try to switch off your microphone and cast it Any for more trouble, I get lot of feedback, lot of background noise. I request everyone to go to your uh, thing, switch off the mic. When needed, please switch off. Otherwise, I request every participant to switch off the mic. Right. Uh, so going back to the energy problem, today is the 
time when we think of totally electric cars or hybrid cars. Most of uh, you would have seen Maruti Sia's cars with uh, electric SVHS. You will see that this SVHS means smart hybrid vehicle designed by Suzuki. What is this uh, smart hybrid vehicle? It uses super capacitors. When the car is breaking down, instead of the usual way of uh, frictional braking through drum or disc, they use electric motors which act as generators. So during the braking period, electricity is generated. This is known as braking regeneration. This regeneration power is available you know, for about 10 seconds or so, but the amount of power of energy available is quite large. Yeah, maybe to a few uh, hundred watts. This energy is available for a short period. Actually, this much of power cannot be dumped onto a battery in such a short duration. Batteries do not have the capacity to take up energy at that fast rate. When we look at batteries, so you are able to see the slides? No, sir. We, I am not sir. I couldn't. Sir, I am not sir. 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 Sir, I will the presentation again. Participant, please don't press the presentation button. Participants, please don't press the participating button. Presenting button. Okay. So, we will continue with it. Yeah. So, as I was uh, talking, the batteries are incapable of taking large amount of energy in a very short duration. So, when we have our uh, household batteries meant for UPS, these batteries char charge at one tenth of their capacity. For example, when we have a iron 50 ampere hour battery, they are charged at about 15 ampere an hour. Beyond that, the battery cannot take it. That means I need to go for a device which can charge very fast and discharge also at a faster rate. Uh, one such device is what we call a supercapacitor. Mostly transition metal oxides are used for this purpose. We will see why it is used as we progress. Can these devices be exploited? Yes, we can exploit it. Already commercial supercapacitors are available. The other names used, is other names used are ultra capacitors and so on. It is an energy storage device with very high ability to store and discharge power. Yeah, and as I said, as I said, they are called as ultra capacitors or electrochemical capacitor. Reason why they are called electrochemical capacitor is some electrochemical reactions are taking place in the These use high surface area nanostructured electrodes. Hot transfer reactions are taking place in the battery. Similar reactions occur here. We are able to learn to learn on belt. This will come to the back station options. So the single gas is conventional capacitor and batteries. Name of the project: Ashwin Val Silicon. Rekin Val Ramuasu. Xavier sir, mic off and so on. Xavier sir, mic off and so on. And this is information. Sir, some other. Can I again request all the participants to switch off the microphones in their device? Because the interface is too much with the presentation. Yes, sir. Lot of Xavier, Xavier, Xavier sir. Switch off your mic. Xavier sir, switch off your mic. You are for certain money to get. Now you are worried. Let go, worried. Yes. Our first monitor atomic size will be important for that development. And you need to verify and perform the iterations. Sir, save it, sir. Hello, sir. 
அவர் ஒண்ணு வெளியில போல Okay. Thank you all uh, for uh, keeping your uh, microphones off. So as I was telling, these are also known as ultra-capacitive electrochemical capacitors because electrochemical reactions are the cause for this capacity, extremely large capacity. Mostly high surface area, nanostructured materials are employed. And in some of the cases, charge cancer reactions happen. And most Simply, these are filling the gap between capacitors and batteries. And uh, what you see to, uh, now is known as the Ragon plot. It gives you a view of what is the power density and what is the energy density. You can easily see that capacitors have a large power density. That means they are able to discharge so much of power or so much of energy in a very short duration. But their energy density is quite small. They cannot hold a lot of power, a lot of energy. Whereas batteries, when you go, you see that they are between 10 and uh, 500 uh, watt hour per kilogram. They are very good as energy storage devices. When the requirement of power delivery or power uptake is not very strict. Now, you will see that if you don't see that... Uh, yellow colored triangle which is super capacitor you will see that there is a large gap we don't have things which are in between like there is the ability to discharge at a faster rate at the same time store enough and more energy with this we see that super capacitors can fill the gap and in the FIAS car example that I was quoting some time back, 
you will see that maruti employs super capacitors along with the batteries super capacitors are put parallel to the batteries so that when the car is braking the super capacitors will get charged up and not the batteries when the super capacitor is charged up because this is a hybrid vehicle along with the diesel or petrol engine the electric engine also would be working and my friends who own this uh, cs car with the chs tell me that the pickup when they start and stop at signals is exceedingly good that will tell you that super capacitor is able to deliver large power and you will be able to work very well so let's again go back to the fundamentals what is the difference between the electrostatic super capacitor electro sorry electrostatic capacitor electrolytic capacitor and the double layer capacitor you will see that the electrostatic capacitor right from the school we have been told that if you have two parallel plates separated by a distance b and the plate area is a then the capacity is epsilon a over d in this slide you will see epsilon not epsilon r a by d and you see that it can be charged very fast when we need large amount of polarization so that the capacity can be improved electrolytes which have large epsilon r the relative permeability their permittivity will the large relative permittivity yeah you can see this like aluminum oxide is used and you see the capacity is enormously increased the next part is the electric double layer capacitor that you can see it is not like the previous two cases now you see that there is an electrode or a charge collection device what you see in the black is a charge collection device then we have an activated carbon on either side of the green line the green line is a separator cum charge reservoir and you see that the charge reservoir means we normally soak a material in electrolyte and that material will act as a charge separator and a reservoir when an electric field is applied to charge this capacitor charges are drawn from the separator cum reservoir and they move towards the two electrodes thereby causing a large amount of capacity you will be wondering why activated carbon is used reasons are simple for this we need nano materials and so i have been talking about the comparison of devices you will see that capacitors can hold only up to 100 milliwatt hour per kilogram which is nothing you cannot even have uh, uh, a bulb or an led run for few seconds let us say batteries are very good they have uh, anything between 10 and 500 of course today you have uh, uh, 2000 5000 watt hour per kilogram batteries and so on super capacitors it's a bit wall slide you can go up to 100 watt hour per kilogram and so on you see that the power density is pretty large and then when you come to the super capacitors there are two kinds of super capacitors that you can think of you will see that on uh, the second line we have two type a uh, ec double layer capacitor and you see a pseudo capacitor this double layer capacitor is usually made of carbon material and carbon materials in the nano form like graphene or the other things like graphene oxide maybe you can think of uh, carbon uh, materials of other Uh, forms like nanotubes 
you can have nano wires and so on the advantage is that all these materials have large surface area when we go to pseudo capacitors we have conducting polymers being employed metal oxides being employed in most of the applications it becomes too difficult to go only with edlc electric double layer capacitor or a pseudo capacitor so normally a mixture of these two materials are used and these are known as hybrid capacitors when we use one side a pseudo capacitor material and the other electrode is the edlc material is called as a hybrid capacitor when we use both sides with the pseudo capacitor material it's called a symmetric material i have not gone till into the uh, double layer and pseudo capacitor what is the mechanism and so on when we look at the mechanism or before the mechanism we will see the uh, device now you will see clearly that it is a multi layer device it is something like a sandwich made up of five layers the two extreme ends seen in the cement color are current collectors usually made of a metal foil or a graphite sheet on that current collector electrode material is coated pasted and bound to that material and then the yellow colored layer that you see is the separator from reservoir of ions what is normally being done is in some cases a cloth known as non woven cloth normally if you have a lens and look at our usual clothing you will see a over layer and it's not strictly a two dimensional thing you can see the third dimension also but these non woven clothes are so flat that they don't offer any difficulty and non woven clothes are soaked in the electrolytes for few hours or even one or two days so that they absorb the electrolyte and they behave as a reservoir and separator you can see that the third layer is again the electrode material the fourth layer the fifth layer is the current collector now what is an electric double layer capacitor here the process is very very similar to the electrolytic capacitor only difference is we don't use the uh, electrolyte as a storage device here we store the energy or charges at the interface between the electrode and electrolyte here what we have is a physical adsorption and polarization taking place interestingly these super capacitors can sustain large number of cycles but their energy density is very small uh, a maximum of about 5 watt hour per kilogram because these carbon materials are very small you know, you know that there is a order of 10 nanometer they have very small pores and they do not permit large amount of electrolytic ions to wet the material what i mean by wetting the material is they should encircle the entire material so that our ability to store the energy at the interface between the carbon and the electrolyte is large the other aspect is whenever we have a voltage source most of you may know that we represented by a thevenin equivalent the thevenin equivalent has got a series resistance which we normally call as the electric series resistance or electronic series resistance and this series resistance is very large inside the device there will be good amount of voltage drop and that will hamper the performance so we want to have as small as a esr or series resistance so that our ability to deliver larger power is enabled and what kind of electrodes are employed for them as i was telling some time back 
it is activated carbon carbon nanotubes graphene graphene oxide they are all used mainly because the surface area is something like 2500 meter square per gram you see enormous surface area being available for a given mark of the carbon and we have very good capacity and because this is a surface phenomena between the electrolyte and electrode the charging curve looks like a rectangular curve i'll talk about cv a little later the uh, <coughs> uh, cv is one thing that permits you to look at the charging uh, profile you can see here that when you keep on increasing the potential the current increases and most of these curves are at uh, they are approximate more to a rectangular curve you can see that the area is smaller at 10 millivolt per second area keeps on increasing and you see that it's almost a linear variation so i'm coming back yapun nadu illu vandada nadu yaro idu idu So as you can see the cyclic voltammogram cv is cyclic voltammogram what we do is we keep on increasing the applied potential at a linear rate and look at the current that is drawn by the material or current that is supplied to the material and you can see that the potential is on the horizontal axis and the current on the vertical axis and you can see that it is mostly linear indicating that it does not involve any other process but polarization now we will move on to pseudo capacitors the pseudo capacitors are the so called reduction oxidation capacitors known as redox super capacitors here the mechanism is entirely different so a part of the charge is stored at the surface of the electrode through the redox reaction the interior of the material takes part in the uh, redox process and we have excellent capacity because we are able to use the inner sides of the electrode and there are physical and chemical changes occurring on the electrode electrode material the only difficulty is the cycling performance is little less but today it is improved many have reported no degradation in the capacity in fact with uh, some of the material like nickel oxide and manganese oxide we have seen that there is no degradation at all and their energy densities are very high right the next question what are all the materials that are employed as electrode in these redox super capacitors mostly people use transition metal oxides polymers and so on the major problem with polymers is that when you keep on cycling it the polymers have a tendency to shrink and bulge something like most of the viewers today would have seen with the old cell phones you keep on charging the cell phone probably after 6 months or 1 year you will see that the back of the cell phone will be bulging and when you open it you will see that the battery shows bulging and so still polymers give us little difficulties but when we move over to other materials we want to see and examine which are all the materials that are suited for this kind of application 
most of us with whatever amount of chemistry we have learnt at school or probably pre university and as a allied subject or major subject all know that the transition metals and rare earth metals have a tendency to show more than one valence state especially the transition metals are the so called iron group metals they show more than one valence state that is when you look at copper copper can exist in cuprous namely the monovalent state and cupric the divalent state when you move over to manganese it is 2 plus and 3 plus iron 2 plus 3 plus whereas metals like in uh, nickel can exist in more than 1 2 3 4 and so on when you go to chromium chromium shows a larger variation chromium 3 plus to 6 plus that means you will be able to dump four electrons whereas if you try to use a monovalent metal like sodium or silver only one electron can be dumped on them now i am trying to use an ion wherein large number of charges can be stored that means the uh, power density energy density will be enormously improved so the major reason for the choice of transient metal ions is that our transient metal oxides is that these metals can undergo more than one oxidation reduction process thereby enhancing the charge storage capacity of a single ion and these show reduction peaks reduction oxidation peaks today people are working on transient metal sulfides and some of the polymers where the problems associated with bulging and shrinking are reduced to a larger extent so the next important thing when you try to design a, a super capacitor is the electrolyte to be used when you work with aqueous electrolyte namely a electrolyte like potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide which is dissolved in water because of the uh, electro decomposition of the water we will not be able to use this electrolyte beyond 1.2 volt when we try to use beyond 1.2 volt the electrolyte decomposes thereby creating bubbles of oxygen and hydrogen which will enormously hamper the operation of the device and so aqueous electrolytes can be used only up to about 1.2 volt the <coughs> the other choice will be to use organic electrolytes like polyaniline mixed with certain conducting materials like lithium perchlorate they can be used up to 2 volt but the problem is these polymers exhibit high resistance or the value of the electrostatic series resistance is large in this case thereby the availability of power is reduced and will not be able to charge them at faster rate the next choice will be ionic liquids these are the best candidate suited for this application these liquids are behaving as conductors at room temperature and interestingly we can work up to 4 and 1/2 volt for a single cell but people may ask me the ionic liquids are very good why do not go for ionic liquids the problem is just for uh, my purpose i try to look at the price even the chinese are charging about 2 and 1/2 3 lakhs per kilogram of these ionic liquids that it tell you why it is not possible so we still work with aqueous electrolytes which are very good only thing is number of cells have to be increased so electrolyte is a major thing people are examining some more organic electrolytes which do not behave badly though we try to use conducting polymers for this purpose so the device is something that we have already seen 
a current collector, as I told you, a graphite sheet or probably a nickel sheet or some other metal sheet with low series resistance. Electrode material in the form of a nano material. A binder is added to it in order to slightly improve the electrical characteristics. A very small quantity of carbon material is added, about 10 to 15 percent is added. A separator is used and this arrangement is made and in order to avoid electrolyte evaporation, it is hermetically sealed or we don't permit the electrolyte to exit this device. So, as I was telling you, the interest in this lecture is more about the materials meant for supercapacitors. The nano materials are to be used, nanotubes, wires, flakes, you can give any name that you feel like because the moment you put your material under an electromicroscope, you will see different types of structures right from interconnected uh, wires, interconnected tubes, interconnected sheets, a yeah, flower-like, mushroom-like, spherical and other things. So these nano materials, the major advantage is they have large surface area for a given mass. The conductivity is enormously increased because of the large contact area and the structural strength of nanostructured material is also very good that the material will not undergo any physical deformation. And this large surface area increases the energy and power densities. The high degree of order can channel energy more efficiently throughout the device. We try to improve the size, weight and performance and these are to fit the requirements. For example, if it is only a static device or a super capacitor to be used at home, we are not bothered much about the mass and all that. But imagine a super capacitor to be fitted into a rocket. Naturally, there, our bother is more about the energy availability per kilogram of the battery. And so, our interest is to improve the capacity per kilogram or capacity per mass. And that's why the capacity of all these super capacitors is given in terms of so many farads per kilogram or so many coulomb per kilogram. People have been fabricating these devices as wearable devices because these are very useful and they can be used in implants like heart machine and so on. These find excellent use in pulsed power systems. For example, in some of the defibrillators, large amount of energy is supplied to the patient in a very short duration, people supply a few millijoules in less than a second so that you are able to revive the person. In detonators also, a large amount of heat is needed immediately and they find it very useful. As I was telling about this uh, regenerative braking, in regenerative braking because energy is generated in a very short duration, like few seconds, we need to charge it up at a very fast rate and they are used. Similarly, in cases where the load keeps on oscillating at a faster rate, the batteries will not be able to take it. The best example I can give you is our experience with compressors running to pump water to the thing. In my area where I am living, Chinalapati, we use mostly compressors and you see that whenever the water is being lifted, you will see that the electric power will fluctuate. The fluctuations are not aware, acceptable by many devices and so to load leveling or to smoothen the load, we can use supercapacitors and they are also employed in uninterruptible systems. The advantages, if you see a nickel cadmium battery or a lead acid battery can be charged only about 1000 times whereas these devices can be charged and discharged over millions of times. They have a long life system and when you want to use it with harvesters, 
advantages, there is no need to maintain them. They are sealed entities, no need to maintain them, no need to grease the ends, no need to add electrolytes, it becomes so easy and they are very good when we use it with buses that start and stop frequently. You know that in many of the places, every half a kilometer, there is a bus stop and so a hybrid vehicle with super capacitors would be most ideal and most importantly, they are all weather applications. They can use the right from Siberian areas to Sahara area where the temperature differences can be as high as 100 degrees centigrade and more. Siberian, it is sub-zero temperatures. When you go to Sahara, it can be 50, 60 degree centigrade and the performance of super capacitors is not altered by the temperature. Though there is a small effect and it's less than few percentage. Right. So having talked about this material, the first question that comes to our mind is what are all the kinds of characterization we need to do with them? The first and foremost is we want to understand the structure and these structures are char characterized through FA diffraction to know whether it is crystalline, amorphous, a composite or a compound. FTIR is used to identify the formation and also presence of water. Raman studies are used to find out what are all the metals available. Whether the metal, and in addition, we also use other techniques like uh, uh, X-ray photon spectroscopy, XPS to understand the value state of the ions. And morphology is another thing. We want to know whether it's a sheet or a tube. Normally, we don't want a tube because the tube area is much smaller compared to a plate-like structure or a spherical structure. Spherical structure is mostly suited because the area is very large. And when we go to capacitors, we try to use a three-electrode configuration. That means we use the material as the working electrode. There will be a counter-electrode. And because we are using two electrodes, a third electrode is used as a reference electrode, thereby we will be able to make the measurement. We also make two electrode systems where, because these two electrode systems are the ones which are practically important. The reason why I say is in a three electrode configuration, we may see the performance to be 1000 farad per gram, but the moment you make a real life two electrode configuration, you will see that the capacity drops down to 50 to 100 farad per gram. And this electrochemical performance will be tested through three important measurements. One is called the cyclic voltammetry. In cyclic voltammetry, what is, what is done is the potential employed is slowly increased at a predetermined rate and the resultant current is measured. So normally this is done in a cyclic manner, like we will go say from 0 to 1 point, plus 1.2 volt and in the reverse direction we will go from plus 1.2 to 0 so that we understand the way charges are given to the supercapacitors and charges are extracted from the supercapacitors because when you go from 0 to 1.2 it is a case of charging of the device. And when you get back, you are trying to uh, recover the charges. The reason why we do all these things is to find out whether the ability of the device to accept and uh, give out charges is good. This is measured in terms of what is known as a Coulombic efficiency, where we try to see the amount of charges dumped in and the amount of charges taken out. But our knowledge normally tells us that if you want to study a capacitor, charge it and look at the potential builder. And that's exactly what chronopotentiometry is about. Unlike the usual charging experiment that we do at the laboratory, what we do here is we try to use a constant current source. At a constant rate, the capacitor is charged and discharged at the same rate. And we look at how the voltage evolves with time 
and that actually gives you why it is called as a chrono potentiometry we try to look at the potential across the device as time evolves and similarly our interest is to know what is happening with the electrostatic series resistance the esr has to be measured and that is measured through electrochemical impedance spectroscopy where we measure the uh, real and imaginary part of the impedance at different frequencies and by fitting this data to an equivalent circuit the series resistance and the capacity can be evaluated so when we talk of these things how do we synthesize because the most important part is synthesis though there are large number of uh, uh, methods available we have employed four important methods one is the precipitation method other is called the sol gel method the third one is the hydrothermal method and fourth one is microwave assisted method so when you look at precipitation method all of you know that that is the most uh, simple elegant method there is no energy budget there is no energy most of the precipitation reactions take place at room temperature and if you look at the yield it is very good you can get even 60 70% yield in precipitation method and it is mostly a single step method you add the reactant you keep one reactant in a solution the second reactant can be added drop wise and we get it but the major problem is in precipitation method we will not be able to control the distribution of sizes of the particles that are formed the variation is so large that many of the workers do not want to go for precipitation method but the precipitation method is one of the methods that is desirable because of the low energy budget and large yield about 60 to 70% yield we have worked with vanadium pentoxide vanadium is another iron group metal vanadium has got a large number of uh, valence states it can be formed in flaky structure we have used vanadium pentoxide dissolved it in deionized water and hydrogen peroxide you know that if the nano material is left to itself there is a process of aggregation and all that which is spoiling the performance so disodium citrate is used as a capping agent so that the size variations are arrested with vanadium pentoxide we got excellent results the interesting aspect is unlike in other materials where only after heat treatment the performance is improved vanadium pentoxide gave us results which are very good because even the as prepared material exhibited the best performance the other method is to go for hydrothermal synthesis where the material the reactants are in the form of a liquid they are put in a sealed container and temperature is increased so that there is a hydrothermal pressure developed and that permits the reaction to take place again it's a very simple setup operating temperatures are very small maybe you can operate 100 to 150 degrees but again because we do not know what is happening when the process is going on we find it too difficult and long heating periods are needed and again you see that in a hydrothermal synthesis the temperature profile in the vessel is not constant and that leads to again variation in the morphology and size the other method is green synthesis method which we have adopted for making nickel oxide and manganese oxide so you don't want to make the process environment unfriendly so to make it environment friendly we go for green synthesis they use toxic chemicals and all that green synthesis doesn't use it we have to use less toxic precursor water is used as the solvent number of steps are reduced energy used is reduced generated waste is also quite small 
So as I was telling you, in the precipitation method, we have a simple low budget method and all that. We have used uh, nickel hydroxide synthesis using this method. Nickel nitrate was started, I mean, that is the starting material. A stabilizing and the capping agent was starch. Glucose acts as a stabilizing agent again. Double distilled water and little bit of ammonia was added. And that gives us excellent uh, nickel hydroxide material, that is starting material. And you can see the XRG pattern, which says that because the peaks are so quite broad, the prepared nickel hydroxide is amorphous in nature. That means I will be able to have a better capacity. The TEM and uh, SEM is the image A. Image A is a SEM image, but you look at the TEM image, you can see that the particles are so small of the order of few tens of nanometer. Yeah, this is a typical uh, a CV graph. What you see on the left side is called the cyclic Volcomo graph. The current is plotted against the applied potential. People can see that uh, the lines go and you see peaks. These peaks are indicative of the reduction. And similarly, when it comes back, you see that in the positive direction, around 0.35 volt, a peak is there. In the negative direction, around 0.25 volt, there is a peak. These are known as the redox peaks. In order to see how fast we can charge and all that, the CV are recorded at different rates of increase of potential from say about 5 millivolt to 50 millivolt per second. When we estimate the capacitance using a simple formula like the charge involved divided by the mass and the rate at which it goes, you can easily see it's from a simple relation like uh, the capacity Q is, capacity C is Q by V and Q is integral I D T. So we try to integrate this current and look at it. But the interesting part is you look at the right hand side. Right hand side gives you a pattern where the capacity is plotted against rate of scale. Most of us have a feeling that the capacity is constant or it is irrespective of the rate at which we are charging a capacitor. But interestingly, we see that the capacity depends on the rate at which you are charging. You see that the capacity is about 350 farad per gram at 5 millivolt per second, whereas when you go to 50 millivolt second, uh, per second, it, is, it comes down to about 90 farad per gram. Why? What is the problem with the thing? Either the device is wrong or we are wrong. But you will see that the physical process is the one that causes this decrease in the capacity. This can be understood easily by trying to understand the way we transport bricks in the olden days, maybe some 20, 30 years back or 40 years back, in a building activity, normally they make what is called as a sarum at different levels people stand and from the ground, bricks are transported one by one. Let us say that the speed of transport is slow. You will see that every brick is collected by the next person and transported to the top of the building where the bricks are needed. But let's say that now the rate at which the bricks are thrown to the first, second person is at a faster rate than he is able to collect. You will see that only a percentage of the bricks will reach the top and some of them will be lost. That's exactly the case because the material is not able to respond immediately to this fast increase because of its inability to respond at a faster rate. At faster scan rates, the capacity drops down.
not the entire charge is stored. Some of the charges are lost in the process. Yeah, it is a simple fact that no teacher of science would accept a measurement with only one methodology. So to make the methodology and measurement appropriate, we go for the chronopotentiometry where at a constant rate the capacitor is charged. You can see that the potential increase is plotted against time and this gives you the chronopotentiometry. You can see that at slow rates the time rate, I mean the time taken for charging and time taken for discharge are similar. You can see that up to about 400 seconds we are charging and it is a discharge rate of up to about 700 seconds and again you will see that at half a milliampere it goes up to 700 seconds but at higher rates the thing decreases. Again, when you look at the current rate of charging and the specific capacitance, there is a decreasing trend. The explanation is the same. The material is not able to respond at that faster rate. And there is a reason why people keep on looking at materials where this decreasing trend can be arrested or at least reduced. The next important thing is the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Now you can see that this slide has got an equivalent circuit. R is the series resistance. Then we have a charge transfer resistance, a Warburg resistance, a double layer capacitance and the capacitance. You will see that the real part and numerical part are plotted and the extended the screen that you see as an inset shows a small semicircle which actually indicates the charge transfer resistance. You can see that it's about 3 ohm, which is an excellent thing. And we try to recalculate this value again by fitting this impedance data to the equivalent circuit. And capacity again, you will see that special capacity is large near static like 0 0.01 hertz and when you go to uh, 1 kilohertz the capacity is small again the same condition that I have discussed some time back. So I will come back to the thing there is some small error. So when we see the thing, again with the impedance spectroscopy, we see that with frequency the capacity decreases. The reason is the same. At low frequencies, the potential is increasing slowly. The electrolyte and the electrode finds enough time for accepting the charges. At high frequencies, the, char the time rate is large, but the thing changes at a faster rate. Probably people who have studied about Dielectrics would know that every dielectric has got its own response and there will be a loss when the frequency increases. Yeah. Nickel hydroxide as such is not a very good material. See, we wanted to convert this nickel hydroxide to nickel oxide. In the process, because we have used the starch and glucose, we have carbonized the starch and glucose to get a nano composite of nickel oxide and carbon. What we did was we tried to look at different temperatures at which it happens and also tried to tune the porous nature. Studies were made by heating the material in air at 400, 500, 600 degrees for two hours. Yeah. The first and foremost thing you may ask me why 
you want to do it for the fire and all that the graph you see on the left side is known as the thermogravimetry when the material is heated linearly from room to the 800 degrees what happens to the mass of the material you will see that the mass of the material decreases to about 85% at 100 degrees and again you see that around 200 degrees there is again a 2-3% decrease in mass and around 350 degrees there is a sudden drop in the uh, material, I mean the mass. The first stage of going up to 100 degrees we say it is the evaporation of water on the surface and interior also will have some amount of water that exits around 200 degrees and entire conversion of nickel oxide to nickel hydroxide to nickel oxide happens around 350 degrees and that is indicated by a large change say about 82 to uh, 50 percent and this is something that you want to understand so what has been done is the material is treated at different temperatures and we have taken the FTIR spectrum. You can see that things around 600 degrees and below gives you the vibrations of nickel hydroxide and all that. And you see that water present is seen at 34-23 centimeter inverse and water keeps on decreasing and at 600 degrees the entire water is removed or even at 400 the entire water gets removed. The thermogravimetry can be used so that the energy budget for preparation is reduced or 500 degrees is very good for our nickel hydroxide to nickel oxide conversion process. Yeah, because we wanted a nano composite of nickel oxide and carbon, reason was simple. Addition of carbon improves the electric, uh, I mean ESR, the series resistance. You can see that when it is treated at uh, 400 degrees and 500 degrees, 400 degrees you cannot see any carbon peaks. The black circles are for carbon. You see that black peaks increase with 500 and 600 degrees or only at 500 degrees we have large amount of carbon available and indication that there is nickel oxide peaks and the carbon peaks indicates that we don't have a composite a composite is formed and a mechanism is given I will try to skip that for the time being because time available is decreasing yeah, this is most important thing. I would like people to uh, put little effort in trying to understand these pictures. I'll try to move them. You'll see that at 400 degrees, there are some pores and all that. But when you heat it at 500 degrees, there are large pores. You look at the whole like structure that's available here. The hole is increasing means pores are more. But when you go to 600 degrees, you see that the porosity is decreased or some of the voids have agglomerated and they have closed and a lump is formed. That way you can see that the best available material or best material for this application where we want large wetting of the electrolyte, the 500 degree material is the best suited. In fact, the electrochemical measurements indicated the same result. Not only that, because we say carbon is available, it's essential to identify whether carbon is really present. To do that, we go for energy dispersive analysis or EDAX. And you can see the EDAX spectrum here. And you see that the atomic percentage and mass percentage of carbon and nickel in it, it confirms that carbon is in the thing because when we treat the 600 degrees, there is a chance that part of the carbon can escape yes, the material. This, in a similar manner, we have made measurements. You can see that we get about 450 per gram. 
Are other, other interesting aspects, I will try to wind up with this, the microwave assisted synthesis. The microwave assisted synthesis is very interesting for a simple reason that it is a very fast synthesis. We could prepare nickel oxide through microwave assisted synthesis in 5 minutes. You can see how fast the process is. The advantage is that there is an increased phase purity. And particle size distribution is very good. Why? Why? What is the reason for this? I do not know whether people have uh, tried to do this uh, dry frying of uh, apple in the microwave oven. Those of you who have a microwave oven at home, try to place either a chapati or apple there. You will see that. Our different regions get heated up easily or you see that in microwave irradiation we create large number of local heat thereby local crystallization would go on and uniform heating is there. The creation of hot spots, hot spots enhance the dissolution and we get excellent material. No other process will give a very good material as microwave acid method. In our methodology, we use a very simple 800 watt microwave oven meant for home use. In 5 minutes of use, it yields excellent uh, material. I request all people to try this if they wish to because it's one of the easiest methodology and the microwave oven is available for about 6 to 7 thousand rupees. The significance is that we have used very little power. When people used uh, a microwave uh, yeah. when people used uh, microwave reactors, these reactors cost a lot of uh, money. They cost a few lakhs, 7, 8 lakhs and all that, but we didn't use a lack worth of thing and we have used only 5 minutes of microwave irradiation and used only 320 watt that means in 5 minutes we use only 20 watt of the power and we got excellent material and the improvement in capacity was phenomenal there is a 70% increase in the capacitance for want of time I have not shown another important aspect which is known as the psychic stability all of you know that when you buy a cell phone, initially probably your phone would have lost money. But as time progresses, probably in six months or one year, you need to charge the phone for a longer duration and the charge will be lost at a shorter duration. That means if earlier it lasted for about uh, 36 hours, after one year it will last only 24 hours and after some time it will be 12 hours. In the morning you take it with full charge, come back home and again you charge it. And this is what we call a psychic stability. Because of the nature of the electrode, the, as you keep on charging and discharging, the capacity will be lost. And you see that the microwave uh, irradiated material or material produced through microwave irradiation gave us a material where the loss is just 2% after uh, 2% after thousands of cycles. So I think I'll, I'll go for some more time. Then for Lama. Uh, right. okay. so we, have used microwave, uh, we have used microwave acid method. Again, the precursor is nickel nitrate. We have used uh, C tab as the capping agent. And you see that the results are very good. And you can see the flakes. The flake is structured through the SEM picture. And you can see that the particles are almost uniform to the TEM image that you see on the right hand side. Again, you see that there is a 
retardation when you go at a fast rate. Yeah. So the next question we ask is if you have a material, is there some possibility by which the capacity can be improved? One method would be to increase it by adding another transit metal ion or probably add a metal which will improve the uh, series resistance. We have tried both. We have tried with uh, cobalt doping into nickel oxide and also silver doping into nickel oxide. You can see that when you dope it, it is only cobalt replacing nickel because the XRD spectrum that you see on the left hand side does not show any peaks other than nickel oxide peaks which means that I have a cobalt doped thing and you see that with 5% we get the average grain size to be very small and that gave us the best performance. Yeah, the most important is the stability. Telling you that the psychic stability is the most important aspect. You can see uh, the pictures. You see that the psychic stability is this. We start with 100 percent, but at 500 cycles, you see that it goes to 80 percent. It is for some other material, and you see that this has to be arrested. An interesting aspect of our work is that we work with manganese oxide. Most of the workers in manganese oxide have stated that within 100 cycles, the manganese oxide loses its uh, capacity. There is a 50 percent loss. We could use a very ingenious method that manganese oxide was coated with starch, capping, capped with starch, and the starch was carbonized so that we had manganese oxide with carbon capping, and that arrested the decay. And even after 5,000 cycles, no degradation could be seen. So, I, I would say that the most of the task that we have in hand is identify a methodology to prepare uniformly small particles, how to improve the cyclic stability and fabricate these capacitors. Thank you very much. Uh, and if there are uh, questions, I will be very happy to uh, accept them. Yeah. So the first question, hello. The first question is one question that I have received is how to reduce the series resistance in the nanomaterials. We cannot straight away reduce the series resistance in nanomaterial. As I told you, one method is to include metals like silver, which drastically improve the uh, conductivity and thereby ESR can be reduced. We have tried it with uh, nickel oxide, manganese oxide and even 10% of uh, silver gives very good reduction. It improves it by 50%. And the next question uh, is from one Mr. Vishnu Shreera. Is it possible to charge a supercapacitor from a fuel cell? Yes. A supercapacitor does not understand where from the charging comes and you can use fuel cell. Any material, as I told you, the only thing is we need to charge it. So fuel cell can be employed to charge the supercapacitor. The third question is about use of supercapacitor in electric vehicles. As I was telling you in the start of the lecture, nowadays hybrid cars and hybrid uh, motorcycles are in the market. In a hybrid vehicle, what they do is they try to use super capacitors in parallel with the battery. 
I was telling you in the regenerative braking, during the braking process, say about 5 to 6 seconds or even 10 seconds, the vehicle is retarding and comes to a stop. During this short period, large amount of energy is generated by the regenerative generator and this has to be charged. As I told you, a battery cannot accept say about 500 uh, uh, joules of energy in 2 seconds or 3 seconds. The best choice will be the super capacitor. So what you see is the entire energy regenerated during braking will be taken by the super capacitor. Secondly, when you use a hybrid car, we have an electric motor working along with the diesel or petrol engine. So, when you are trying to accelerate at a signal, you need to have a large acceleration you are able to go ahead and electric motor is assist thereby making instant start from rest. So, yeah. so we, then the next question is by one uh, Mr. Naresh Muthu. Which technique is more, most suitable to capacity, I mean, calculate the specific capacity, CV or uh, galvanic charge discharge? Both are essential because we don't want to depend on one method. When we are using CV, we try to look at the integral of IDT. There was a time when we started working with this, many of the workers were using the peak current and we could identify that use of peak current is a erroneous way and that gives us a overestimate of the capacity. Whereas when we integrate all the people with uh, some amount of electricity will know that the integral IDT gives you the charge store and CV is one method. The other part is when you go to the galvanostatic charge discharge or the chrono ampero amperometry, what you have is the current is constant. So it is T, it is only IT, time is known, calculation becomes far more simpler. Yeah, the other thing, IR drop in DCD curve, what is the reason behind IR drop? As I told you, the electro ESR or the series resistance is one thing, if the series resistance is more, during the discharge process, instead of the entire voltage being available, V minus I times R will be the voltage that is available. Not only that, that will lead to heating up of the capacity, which is not uh, a good way of doing it. Though we have seen it, the heating up can spoil the electrolyte available. So how to calculate specific capacity value from CV curves is a question by one uh, Dr. Venkatachala. Again, we have to use the integral of the area. So what we do is we try to integrate, a simple thing is the data is available with you. You can use a simple numeric algorithm. Simple thing is for every quarter second or so or every 5 seconds or 10 seconds, the data of our voltage and current is available. We can just add them up and multiply by the interval so that it comes. Probably if you can send me a mail on my mail ID, I think mail ID is available in that invitation. You can uh, take my mail ID, which is very easy to remember. M U R A L I G R U Murali G R U. No space, nothing. You can use my mail ID Murali G R U at gmail.com. I can send you more information. If there are other questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Email ID is sent on this link. Or please visit the uh, Dandigaram Rural Institute website where you can again find my mail ID. Yeah, I, I, I could see some uh, material which somehow uh, flew away. Yeah, I could see that one uh, Farid Khan has asked a question, what are the advantages when we do atomic level engineering instead of morphology alteration? The atomic level engineering does not permit us uh, to a larger extent. For example, 
இல்ல அட்டாமிக் லெவல் இன்ஜினியரிங் பீப்புள் ட்ரை டு டு ஐதர் மாலிகுலர் அசம்பிளி ஆர் ப்ராபப்ளி வாட் யூ கால் இஸ் மாலிகுலர் பீம் எபிடாக்ஸி இன் ட்ரை டு கெட் அ தின் ஃபில்ம் இன் ஆல் தீஸ் திங்ஸ் தி மார்ஃபாலஜி கேனாட் பீ கண்ட்ரோல்ட் வேரஸ் இன் தீஸ் திங்ஸ் பை யூசிங் மார்ஃபாலஜி அசிஸ்டிங் மெட்டீரியல்ஸ் லைக் சீடாக் மார்ஃபாலஜி கேன் பீ டியூன்ட் அண்ட் பை அப்ரோப்ரியேட் அடிஷன் ஆஃப் கார்பன் மெட்டீரியல் டு அபவுட் டென் பர்சன்ட் ஆல்சோ the series resistance also can be reduced whereas in this atomic level engineering addition of a second material becomes too difficult yeah the i'd like to look at another question by one dr lakshmanan what is the significant role of starch as stabilizing agent starch permits you to control the size and it also acts as a capping agent as i told you for certain materials where you want to Uh, have a carbon coating or carbon capping starch can be carbonized at about 500 degrees so that we have a carbon capping carbon capping otherwise cannot be achieved as i was telling you about this in the lecture in the case of manganese oxide when manganese oxide is employed in aqueous electrolytes manganese 2 plus dissolves and gets into the electrolyte thereby there is a depletion of electrode in the uh, electrode when there is a depletion of the electrode it leads to drastic decrease in the capacity this can be avoided by proper capping when you do capping with carbon the advantage is the series resistance is improved but we don't have any uh, decrease or drastic reduction in the charge transport capability Yeah, if there are any questions, I am looking at a few more questions. Yeah, so Farid Khan again has asked another question. What makes the supercapacitor good at power density? As I told you, the main problem that we face with the batteries is that batteries cannot supply large amount of power in a short interval at the same time a capacitor cannot store large amount of energy so as a via media between the two a super capacitor is able to deliver large amount of energy in a short period and that is the reason why i said it is useful in regenerative braking where the generator energy is available only for a very short duration a battery cannot be charged at this higher rate yeah then uh, i am happy to see one uh, miss shanmuga priya asking a question what about the environmental hazardness it is almost nil no maintenance is needed we are not using hazardous materials even the preparation routes have become more green we don't use many step you use precipitation route where the yield is high that means wastage generated is quite small go for microwave method where we it's a single step process we don't have difficulties yeah, the other question is by uh, one with kamalaveni harichandran is what is the maximum capacitance value people go to few thousands of uh, farad per gram 2000 farad per gram the other question is very relevant to this day can we destroy covid 19 with these cells unfortunately these are energy storage devices they do not interact with any uh, virus like covid i'm just trying to look at uh, two more questions yeah this is very actually I, i don't know someone has uh, put it as hod physics i don't know who it is uh, with the department uh, the comment is that as the scan rate increases redox reaction increases which will increase the specific capacitance but it shows a decrease why is a nice question so this though the statement says that with increase in scan rate redox reaction increases unfortunately we miss a thing 
for any reaction to take place there is a time involved in the reaction that is why i said we can use the analogy of bricks being transported in a building work if you are throwing bricks at a faster rate the response time of the worker is so small that he collects only a fraction of the bricks thrown whereas when you throw it at a slower rate the collection is more because he is responding at a faster rate right so the important aspect here is not just the redox reaction but the rate at which the redox reactions happen and if we can find some methodology by which the redox reactions can be hastened or made fast this will improve it Yeah, then the question is about three electrode geometry three electrode geometry is very easy to make and when you want to examine the normal use a three electrode geometry is the most suited one because in three electrode geometry if it's not working well you don't spend much time in trying to assemble a two electrode material the, because of simplicity three electrode method is used to initially understand it's something like a pilot study when we really go for making a capacitor we make only a two electrode capacitor so thank you all for your patient listening if possible please send me a feedback so thank you thank you so much thank you sir thank you sir sir thank you thank you will post the thank you sir so i am jaya yeah. assistant professor of physics sir on behalf of our college sir our hod sindhri yeah. karan kalayar sir i thank you for yeah. your uh, kind uh, help sir you have given and a nice you, talk and uh, there is a overwhelming response of the participants i also thank the participants and i also thank the colleagues for uh, i also thank the colleagues for their uh, organization of this uh, program the program is very successful so thank you so thank, thank you thank you madam i am very happy in short notice you could arrange it and uh, uh, there is a uh, overwhelming response thank you so much for the opportunity I thank every one of your colleagues, especially my good friends, uh, Professor Sundaraisen and uh, Dr. Jay Kumar. Yes, sir. Fact, whatever I talked about this nickel oxide material, it's a doctor work of uh, Dr. Jay Kumar. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. That wonderful yes, session. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank sir, you all. Thank you. Ah. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So the participants uh, can uh, fill the form, uh, feedback form, and they will be getting the certificate. Uh, sure, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Can I close it? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you.